No, we need, uh, we need uh, Barbara for that. <laughs> it's an ordinary day on the set of Coronation Street, but one of the show's most famous faces, Deirdre Rashid, is nowhere to be seen. Instead, Anne Kirkbride, the actress who plays her, has more pressing things on her mind. This is bizarre. I don't understand this at all, but if it keeps her quiet and happy, I say, well, do it. But you'll suddenly see her with the old marigolds on. I'm just going to clean the tiles in the toilet. Why? I get fed up. I get bored because we're sort of sitting around all day. Sometimes, you know, when you're in early in the morning and then you're not in again till later. And I just think, what can I do? And I, I love cleaning. I'm a compulsive cleaner. I'd done this one day, I squirted bleach down the toilet. She went mad, she came out, she said, Annie, have you just squirted bleach down the toilet? She said, Annie, choke me. <laughs> but it's, uh, the cleaner lets me help, you know. <laughs> if that's her therapy, then so be it. That is just the way she is. Well, she's doing nobody any harm, is she? Well, she's doing that. Happier in rubber gloves than in the limelight, Anne Kirkbride, known as Annie, is no ordinary soap star. Little is known about the woman behind those famous glasses. She rarely gives interviews and guards her privacy fiercely. Yet over the years, she's faced her own real-life dramas, battling serious illness and depression. One of the most famous faces in Britain, for the first time, this film gives an insight into the woman they call the Weatherfield One. Fed up here. I ate this dump. I ate the job. And I ate. Deirdre! All of you. I ate you, you rotten cowie tart! For 29 years, oh, Annie has played the woman who sums up the spirit of Coronation Street. Warm, weary, and constantly trying to improve her lot. As Deirdre Anne Rashid, her tears and traumas have always attracted the show's highest ratings. You're staying here! I am hell as like! I have had just about all I can take off you. And if you want to stop me, you'll have to kill me! What on earth? If there's a crisis in Weatherfield, Deirdre is never far away. She is probably one of the finest, and I really mean this, one of the finest actresses I've ever worked with. Deirdre, listen, I think maybe we're out. <laughs> Deirdre, please, please. We don't want to go there. Your Deirdre Dev love scenes. <laughs> I thought about this after they were filmed. And there was a lot of press interest, and I got a, a, a sort of big response from the, you know, the people that were watching it, you know, saying they enjoyed it. And then I thought, it really had nothing to do with me. You know what I mean? It's almost like I was working with this kind of almost like this icon, this person that's been in, in sort of the, the, the public sort of gaze for I don't know how many years. But uh, people have grown up with her. So it really was about her and not about me. And it's the first time as an actor I've really felt that, but in a good way. <laughs> What I do every so often is uh, I, I go through my wardrobe and things that I still quite like, but I'm not likely to wear again for me, um, I pass them on to Deirdre. We're not alike. There are similarities and there are differences. Um, it's so hard to tell where one ends and the other one begins. I'll go out and I'll, I'll buy something and I'll wear it and I don't feel right in it. And I think, why? What is it about this? And it suddenly dawns on me, it's a Deirdre dress. It's not a me dress, it's a Deirdre dress. And I take it into wardrobe and say, I've done it again. Bought another frock for Deirdre by mistake. And they go, oh, great. <laughs> and then it goes on Deirdre's rail. <laughs> it's an understandable mistake when you've lived inside the same character for so long. Now 47, Annie was just 17 when a chance audition set her on the road to stardom. I was down here for an audition 
for something. And I was useless, I was really bad. But they said, while you're here, just nip over to the Coronation Street office because they're looking for someone to do three lines in the street. Somebody with a good northern accent who can act a bit. Same again? Uh, no, not for me, thanks, Jimmy. I have to be off. Oh, so soon. Well, there's something about the atmosphere in here today. It puts me off. Yes, it is a little too close for comfort, isn't it? See ya. Are you coming, Annie? Yeah. I said, is that it? Have I got the job? He said, yep. He said, if we like you, we might even write you some more in. You never know. And I went back down to my dad, who was waiting for me outside in the van, and I cried. And he said, never mind, love, you'll get the next one. I said, no, I'm not crying because I didn't get it. I'm crying because I didn't get it. I don't want to do it. I really didn't want to do it. I don't know, I think it scared her a bit. And she thought her, her whole life was going to change. That's how she likes her life to... She likes it to be predictable. You know, she doesn't like the unpredictable. So, uh, she got over it, you know. It was, she was happy as Larry when, by the time we got home, you know, she was, she was, she was okay. But I said, it's, it's a great opportunity, you know. I said, who knows where you'll finish up. More than 2,000 episodes later, she's still here. A little older, a lot wealthier, and far more famous than she could ever have imagined. It's given me an awful lot in, in terms of material stuff. I've got a, a nice home. I'm able to come on lovely holidays like this. It's given me emotional and job security and stability. And the most important thing of all, my husband, David, it's given me that. Because if it wasn't for the street, I would never have met him. Hello. Mrs Barlow. Deirdre. Deirdre. Well, come in. They met nine years ago when David Beckett, a jobbing actor, landed a six-month contract to play the street's handyman, Dave Barton. Should be able to get what I need next week. Well, I'm really pleased with it. It wasn't long before romance blossomed for both Deirdre and Annie. Six o'clock, uh, fancy a drink next door? There was an attraction right at the start between David and me, definitely. But it was something that we both tried to ignore. Well, I'm expecting Tracy back any minute. Ah, oh. right. What brought it to a head, I think, was when we had to do a kissing scene. And the scene opened with us passionately kissing for quite a long time. And once she'd had that sort of physical contact, it, it really started to get difficult. I've never kissed a counsellor before. I was beginning to think you never would. She rang me up one night, she said, Dad, David and, and I are going to get engaged. I said, I'm not a bit surprised, love. She said, how did you know? Because I'd never really met him. I said, look, I've been watching you two on the, on the television, I said, and, and those kisses are for real. I said, there's nothing acted about that. So she thinks I'm a genius. <laughs> no, he never fancied no. Deirdre. Never fancied no. Deirdre. Because you no. said that, didn't you? Yeah. yeah that was the, the, that was the amazing thing. He had the... never felt anything remotely no. for Deirdre. It's... I'd seen it for, obviously for years and... Never felt the slightest. Yeah. yeah. But I think he fancies me. That's the difference me. between you and Deirdre, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. You aren't Deirdre. No, I'm not. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> Here I am making you a sincere offer. All right, proposing if you like. And what do you want, eh? All the candles let me down on one knee? I don't want it at all, in any way, shape or form. Deirdre might have refused to walk down the aisle with Dave, but Annie couldn't wait, and the two married nine years ago. I never thought I'd get married. I mean, it, it wasn't on the agenda. So that was the only daunting thing. I mean, for me, she wasn't Deirdre or a, a face or whatever. She was just Annie. She was... A great mate. Still are, aren't you? Yeah. Talk to me. I'm no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just listening to you, darling. Makes a change, doesn't it? <laughs> Annie has a six-week break from Coronation Street and she's making the most of it. She and Dave love Spain and holiday here twice a year. It's their favourite place to unwind and relax. So much so, they're planning to buy their own villa. 
I'd love to do that. I'd love to have a place out here. Decorate it. All these wonderful big Spanish bowls and things that you see that you can't buy because you can't get them back home and get all that sort of stuff. As I said, it's got to be the right... It's got to be the right place. There's no point doing it for the sake of doing it. We don't want a new villa. We want somewhere with a bit of character. But uh, we want to get it at the right price so we can spend a bit of money on it and, uh, and make it lovely without spoiling the, you know, the, the rustic quality. A welcome break from Weatherfield also allows Annie to spend precious time with her brother John, sister-in-law Jackie and her two-year-old nephew, Sammy. I absolutely adore him. He's the first baby we've had in the family. Um, because I've never had children and uh, John's left it quite late to have children and we just didn't think it was going to happen. And the love is quite frightening, it's overwhelming. I just absolutely adore him. I would do anything for him. I've never felt so strongly. Despite her feelings for Sammy, Annie has never wanted children of her own. Although I love children and I have got a maternal instinct, it's never been that much of a burning issue with me. Or else I would have had to do something about it. And I think I'm just probably one of those people who weren't meant to have children. Those are nice chips. Those black ones. A confirmed shopaholic, holidays are the perfect excuse for Annie to spoil herself. That's a nice basket. Oh, yeah, I like those. Let's have a look. And they actually... Oh, they are bonny. ...are very similar to that ring I bought last time I was here. Yeah, I'll take those, please. Thank you. Uh, I could do with going in here, actually. Much to Dave's exasperation, the shops of Marbella prove impossible to resist. I'm just going to pop in here. I want some makeup brushes. She's almost run out of eyeshadow. <laughs> Got two eyes. <laughs> Some after sun. It's lovely that. Some makeup brushes and some eyeshadow. All of which I needed. Oh, bikini shop. Six thousand nine hundred. Oh, that's nice. Bloody ass. I love that. It whistles every time you go past. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. It's like his daddy now. Have you seen this, darling? <laughs> oh, God, I might have to get that. No. No, no. all right. No. <laughs> no. No. Yes. After 29 years on Britain's longest running soap, there are few places Annie can go without being recognised. Even abroad, there's no escape. Oh, I know you're an Oliver. It's all right. The kids would love to take him to school. <laughs> Somebody's texting me. There you go. Thank you so much. OK. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah. Have Thank a nice holiday. Thank you. 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 Do you mind being asked for your autograph, Annie? Um, well, you sort of expect it when you're in a, a busy town. Um, so you kind of gear yourself up for it. And I've got away with a lot this this holiday because we've been staying in the villages and I haven't nobody's bothered me at all so but you, you kind of expect it to happen when you come to a place where there's lots of people. Come here sweetheart. Come here. Thanks very much. Have you a photograph date with this strange lady? This, this is the most famous lady in the world. <laughs> She's from Carnation Street. Granny would be delighted. <laughs> you just... <laughs> if, you were from, if you were from Cartoon oh. World now or something. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, darling. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> I think I'd find it odd now if, if people didn't stop me and go a bit funny in shops. I'd wonder what was the matter with them. <laughs> How do you think Annie's coped with fame? I just cope very well, I think. It hasn't gone to her head in the least. As you can see, she's still the same man. Hasn't changed her one bit. Except she has more money, of course. Yes, it's... Uh, and it's far more difficult to buy presents for her now on birthdays and things like that. 
Because she's got everything. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Annie. Happy birthday to you. Oh, that's fabulous. Thank you. Happy birthday, darling. Thank you. Thank you. Darling. Oh, <laughs> that is lovely. Birthday tart. I got a wonderful digital camera, which I've been using this morning, and it's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. You can view the pictures as soon as you've taken them. And uh, I got some jewellery from my dad and John and Jackie. And uh, a book, what's it called? Something about roads to ecstasy. Yes. Loads of cards. Is that all right? Lovely. Aren't they gorgeous? But the day is also tinged with sadness. It was on her birthday eight years ago that Annie's mother Enid suddenly died. The whole thing was a, a bit of a shock, really, because we didn't know until three months before she died that she was really ill and they diagnosed it with cancer of the liver. And by the time they found it, it started in the bowel and it was too late, too late to do anything for her, really. It had got to her brain and she'd gone, really, by then. And then a week later, she was really gone. I think she always had a guilt feeling about her mum that she didn't get on better. But, um... They loved each other. I mean, there's no doubt about it. They loved. They just did not understand each other. Nothing like that had ever happened to me before. I'd lost relatives and people close, but your mum, it's different. And there just wasn't anywhere to put it. I didn't know how to feel, and it was just the weirdest feeling. And I missed her dreadfully, and I still do. I still think I see her sometimes. I see someone who looks like her from the back, and I think it's her, and, and I know it's not, but just for a minute, I pretend it's her. But Annie had little time to mourn. On the day she buried her mother, she discovered a lump in her own neck. She too had cancer, a rare but curable form called non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Eight years on, she's still struggling to come to terms with the illness, fearing it may one day return. Her yearly checkup is a day she dreads. I still don't accept, totally, that it's gone. Every time it comes up to checkup time, it's like that little voice starts up. What if, what if something shows up on the X-ray? What if there's something in the blood? What if there's a little lump somewhere that I'm not aware of that they find? Right, should we just examine you, please? Yep. The checkup consists of an examination, a blood test, and a chest X-ray. Only when her consultant is satisfied with all three can Annie be given a clean bill of health. Yeah. We'll just uh, check your neck first to make sure that's okay. Now, there's absolutely nothing to feel. Now I need to get you on the couch now to check the rest of your uh, uh, right. rest of your gland areas. Goal, David. Well done. Yeah. First time. First time. <laughs> yes. Brilliant. It's not Brilliant. the easiest person to get blood from, but we've managed it. Yes. <laughs> he always says, I don't know how we managed to get chemo into you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we had a struggle sometimes. It's... Right, we're going to get you for an X-ray now. One very low point was when my hair came out. That that I found very hard to cope with. She decided that when it started coming out. She was going to have her head, head, she was going to shave her head rather than watch it slowly fall out. So we went into the bathroom and put some lather on my head and we got my lady's razor and started shaving my head with this lady's razor with me sobbing the whole time. She <laughs> cried and screamed into the mirror with anger and frustration and fear and all the emotion that comes with being ill. That was, I think, the lowest point, and he just held me and I held him and I just screamed. I just, it's the only thing I could do to let the emotion out. I just remember just screaming. She just 
held me and hit me and kicked me and just sort of vented her anger at the illness on me and... Okay, this is Becky to say. Yes, okay. Would you like to slip your dressing gown off for me? Yeah. I think I just need to cope with that period. Was watching Annie suffer. Watching her turn from a... 40-year-old woman into an 80-year-old woman in a matter of two weeks. Just watching her physically deteriorate so rapidly. Finally, we've just got a lead apron here to protect your lower body, so if you'd like to hold on to that. Okay, that's fine, we've finished there. So if you'd like to take a seat back in the waiting room, okay, while we develop that. Okay, thank you. After the examination and blood test, Annie and Dave must wait for the results of her chest X-ray to be sure the cancer has not returned. It's a long and agonising wait. OK, Mrs Beckett, that's fine. We've finished there. So if you'd like to set those down to the clinic. OK, thanks okay. Bye -bye. Thanks very much. Bye. Oh, no, I'm just going to put OK, love. I'll see you in a minute. OK. Looks perfectly normal to me. It'll obviously be reported later by the radiologist, but perfectly clear. The lung feels are nice and healthy, so no problems. <laughs> <laughs> So that's all good news. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <She's trying>. <laughs> <laughs> no. I still get scared. That's, that's you know. normal. I still get. <laughs> it's. You see, it always worries you, doesn't it? I know. I think it probably does everybody, doesn't it? I you think know, everybody there's always does that. that little chance yeah. that there might be something. And yeah. When Every you say those magic words, it's just, it's joy. It's like being given a wonderful gift. Thank Everybody's you. worried, and I think they all get a bit apprehensive. Yeah, yeah. So, you. shall we see you, uh, see you in another year? Yeah. All right? Yeah. That's really awesome. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> Oh, darling, oh. Out to the sunshine. Oh, God, look at that. I can breathe again now. It's that final thing, the X-ray, puts that up, and it's like this huge weight goes off you. Because the weeks before, I think you've gradually been kind of psyching yourself up, just in case there's something to prepare yourself for. And it's just like being released from something. It's wonderful. You realise how lucky you are to have good health. I mean, I never thought I would say that. It's such a cliche, isn't it? But you really do appreciate your health. It's the best gift you can have. It's a joy. Because <laughs> if you've got your health, you've got the world. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Annie's home from Spain and her six week break from the street is nearly over. Tomorrow it's back to work, so a trip to the hairdressers is necessary to make sure Deirdre's hair looks the same as it did before Annie's holiday. So I don't start running into continuity problems, you know what it's like. We're in continuity. Yes, we will be soon. Okay, now just get me a gown. Okay, love. I was very nervous when I first met her, when I first introduced to her. I couldn't quite remember what, what the hairstyle was. I was hoping it wasn't the, uh, the curly perm. Um, I wasn't responsible for that. Nobody liked it. <laughs> People used to say, you know, I'd say, oh, I'd, I'd, I'd like a perm doing. I don't, I don't want a Deirdre perm, nothing is quite as tight as that. I think they were giving away free Deirdre perms as a booby prize on a radio show at one point. I loved it, because I've always wanted curly hair. <laughs> I think Annie's far more beautiful than Deirdre. But there are times when I look at her and I think she looks like an older Sharon Stone or something. She's got the most beautiful face. She really sort of lights up well. 
Scrubs up well. <laughs> it's 8 a.m. and Annie's first day back to work since her holiday is going to be a long one. To save any unnecessary hanging about at the studio, she always gets ready at home. It only takes me about 10 minutes to do my own makeup. And it's, it's just a normal sort of everyday makeup. So, you know, I don't actually have to go to makeup and get, get it done. It's nothing too, too difficult. I just virtually do the same makeup that I do for myself. So it's quick makeup on, hair done, ring the taxi and uh, get in with enough time to get changed. The Coronation Street schedule is gruelling. Hi, Ken. Hi, I'm. Four episodes a week mean that every day, 20 scenes must be recorded. There is no time for rehearsal. Actors have to be word perfect. I'm just going to have a look at some words, Ken. You've got to be on the ball. You've got to be on top of the lines before you go in there. Just, um, there's, no, there's no other way to do it. We are taking this How are you? Oh, good. You're looking ever so well. Thank you. you know, if you have a scene with someone else, you just go and find them and say, "Do you want to run this scene?" And we'll we'll run it together. You know, and until we get it pretty well word perfect. Do we know it? I think so. Right. Do you want to run it? At yes. Some point? Go on then. Do you want to run it now? Yeah. All right then. Who starts? Me, I think. Go on, then. He wants us to remortgage our house. He must be joking. He must be joking! <laughs> no, he's quite serious <laughs> about it, as a matter of fact. Don't tell me you're seriously considering it. Well, I did say we'd think about it, yeah. <gasps> Look, I know it might seem a mad idea, but honestly, I've never seen him so enthused by anything. Look, since he left the Navy, he seems to have lost all purpose in life. At least this gives him a goal. Oh, some goal, running a bookies. Yeah, but better than nothing. Look, Ken, I know you want to help. And if it was just a question of lending him some money, then maybe, but we're the ones who'd be taking all the risks. What if we lose our home? We're too old to start again. <laughs> <laughs> I think Bill definitely brings out the best in me. Um, partly because of the fact that I can trust him so completely uh, and because he is so good. And if you work with people who are good, it always makes you look better. Annie and Bill, can I just see you walk in with slightly changed our shot, please? We've been told our position. That's the first. We've never actually been there. And we'll just do it now, and then we'll go for a take. Yeah. And there's Great. No, no prompting, and you've got to be word perfect. <laughs> and action. You lot blanched in the load, didn't you? Yes, I did. Thank God. Right, just hold it there, please. And I'm delighted that I help and bring the best out in her because that's exactly what she does to me. Over the years, theirs has become one of the best love partnerships on television. When they married in 1981, newspapers reported that their wedding was even more popular than Charles and Diana's two days later. But wedded bliss was short-lived. We're in love, you agree with that, don't you? Deirdre soon found more passion in the arms of Corrie Casanova, Mike Baldwin. Keep our cool and pick our time. When it came to choose between the two, Deirdre had 26 million viewers, one of Coronation Street's highest ever audiences on the edge of their seats. Ken, don't let me go. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. I don't know why I'm doing this. <laughs> you and, and Uncle Albert and Tracy. I, I couldn't go through the door, can I go? Please don't say I've got to go. I'll do anything. I'll, I'll go and see my Baldwin. I'll tell him I'll, I'll never see him again. I'll never see him again as long as I live. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'll... 
I'll tell him. <laughs> it does seem to be quite important to people, this Ken and Deirdre thing, and when we're not together, that is the question you get asked more than any other is, are you and Ken going to get back together? And, and people now say to me, are you and Ken going to get married again? Because we're not actually married. For Dave, acting now takes second place. Since marrying, he's taken on a very different role, that of house husband. He accepts that Annie's career must come first and daily rounds of golf help while away the long hours that she spends on Coronation Street. I play four or five times a week. It's important because it gives me, I suppose it gives me that spirit of competition and uh, achievement, which I now don't get from work. I used to find it far harder than I do now, purely because I'd always been in a position where work was the most important thing in my life. Right. Now it's not. And is the most important thing in my life now. So it's not difficult now. Initially, when, when Dave and I got together, he didn't want to feel that he was freeloading or whatever. But I mean, it, it's not a question of that. And it's just a fact of life that I have an, a regular job that brings in good money. And, um, and David's contribution is immense. He, he takes care of me, takes care of all our finances. Um, when he's not working, he's there. He's, he's got a meal on the table for me when I come home. Do you ever envy? For success in in acting. Yeah, yeah, of course I do. I don't, I don't, I don't think envy is the right word, but I'm, I'm certainly. I don't envy her her success. I just wish that I'd had more, in my own right. I think that's a true that's a true statement. Yeah. Annie also enjoys the occasional workout, though not on the golf course. God, you can really feel it in your buttocks. Don't press the Alfaro. <laughs> Oh, no. Well, this it. is quite fast enough for me. Oh, that's rather nice. Can you set it up a bit? Yeah, turn it on one. OK. I'm on four now. That's like you're I'm doing something. Like who? <laughs> that's oh, it. yeah, yeah. She's spending the weekend away with her oldest friend, Kirstine, at a health spa as part of her fitness routine. <laughs> oh, I was made for gyms. <laughs> Your little legs are going. <laughs> I do watch my weight, yeah, just uh, keep an eye on it because you see yourself all the time and telly puts about £10 on you anyway. So um, I, I do like to keep an eye on it and I try and eat sensibly. And there's nothing more embarrassing than having to go into wardrobe and say, Deirdre's clothes don't fit me anymore because I've put half a stone on or something. So uh, no, try and keep, try and keep my weight down. A weight loss it'll be, won't it? <laughs> Calories, 3.7. She may be conscientious about her weight, but despite her illness, there's one vice she simply cannot do without. I'm a definitely a confirmed smoker, but uh, I don't know, you've got to do something. Were <laughs> you ever trying to give up? I did try to give up. I was so miserable. And I actually went through a phase of smoking cigars. Um, but uh, then I went back on cigarettes again. But I just love them. I really enjoy cigarettes. I know my specialist wanted me to give up, but at the time uh, that I was having the chemo, it was just, I, I couldn't cope with giving up smoking as well as everything else I was going through, you know? It was just too much. And, um, and I have a chest x-ray every year, and that's always clear, so... Just keep doing it. Uh, it's my thing. <laughs> Despite her hectic life, Annie's number one priority is her family. Every week she makes the short journey to her childhood home in Oldham, where she shops and cleans for her father, okay. Jack, and Uncle Arthur. Hi. Hello. Hello, Daisy. Hello. Hello, Dad. You all right? Fine. No, oh, good to see you. Oh, okay. I've got bags. Got your bags. Thank you. 
Hi, Anonks. Oh, Anonks. You all right? Yeah. Oh, mm. yum, 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 yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. I thought it was going to be a bit... No, we're not set off it. We're having spaghetti and some toast for lunch. Is that all right? Ooh, Guess great. what? Chicken pies. <laughs> <laughs> She'd make a great hospital matron, you know. Well, this, this business about dirty wards, there'd be no dirty wards if she was the matron. She'd do it herself. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Usually at some period during the week she'll come up here if she's got some time off and sort us out. She'll go through the house like a whirlwind, you know, the vacuum cleaner and change the beds and one thing and another because it's never good enough. And she'll always find where we haven't dusted, you know. We, we try to dust before she comes. But she'll always find something we've missed. I just like to keep the place in shape. I always think my mum's going to come back and go mad because the place is a mess. And I always kind of got it in the back of my mind that she might come back one day. It's weird, isn't it? I mean... But I just think, what would she say if she came back and saw it? So I have to keep it right. And also for them, because it's... I don't want them not living in the clean place. And, you know, I just want it right. I want it right for them, because I love them. <laughs> <laughs> She doesn't talk much about the job. We never know what's going to happen on the street, you know. Oh, I should think they find it flattering. Well, look, Arthur, there's our cleaner on telly. Oh, yeah. I don't think she ever really thinks of herself as a big star. She's not interested in that side of it. She just wants to be herself and do what she likes to do, and that's it. I'm not really comfortable with showbiz. I'm just not happy in those situations. I like the job, I like acting, I'm at home doing that, I couldn't do anything else, but the rest of it doesn't suit me. So I like to come home at night and just be normal. Home is somewhere where I can shut the front door and I can be totally myself, I can switch off. And this is where people can't get to you. You've got to have somewhere where you can hide. This is my little space, my world, my room. Um, got all my clothes in here, wardrobes. So we don't have our clothes in the bedroom. We've each got a room that's kind of for us and with our, our things in. Uh, pictures of me when I was at Oldham Rep there in hay fever with Jesse Matthews, that's my granddad, with his horse, Nellie Diamond. He loved that horse. Valentine's present from David. <laughs> Sammy loves that dog. And Teddy's. All have special significance. The white one was made for me by my mum. So that's treasured. Annie was very reluctant to allow cameras into her home. In the end, we agreed to film in just this one room. It was a difficult decision because I said initially that I didn't want any filming to be done at all in the house. It is my, my retreat, my place where nobody, nobody can get me. The only people who come here are the people I want to come here. And I just felt weird about letting cameras in here and, and letting people see into my world, I suppose. It's a big day for Deirdre. After wearing the same glasses for 15 years, scriptwriters have decided it's time for a change. Oh, what have I told you about Carrie? Oh, my big... <clears throat> glasses. <laughs> oh, they're all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> Now, we've just got to be careful we don't see that the bottom of the box is not there. I'm really going to drop it. Gonna mind me. Bollocks. OK, thank you. Gangway! Oh, hang on a minute. Move, 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 move. Come on, what have I told you about trying to get a mind me? About trying to get a mind 
I knew this scene down. would be tricky. Yeah, lifting it high enough to go over. Yeah, without. <laughs> yeah, without tipping it. Yeah, it's like a tipping. What have I told you about that? Going my bed to the drop. Oh, I knew that was going to happen. Oh no! I'm sorry. Look at them. Oh, what am I going to do? Coronation Street's Deidre Rashid is to ditch her famous large frame glasses for a set of trendy specs. A veil of secrecy surrounds the reason behind the move, but it's believed Deirdre, played by Anne Kirkbride, is forced to buy the glasses following an incident in the corner shop with street heartthrob Dev. I'm Anna Dawson. I'll update you on Key 103 in 60 minutes. Her new glasses will be just her fourth pair in 29 years. And not surprisingly, it's headline news. What's going to happen is the readers of The Sun and people on the website, the Coronation Street website, are actually... Those are nice. I like the blue. Are actually going to choose the glasses that Deirdre will wear in the show. But I'm just trying them on to see what they all look like. Those are quite nice as well. But they make me look as if I've got two sets of eyebrows. But it's really not up to me. So I hope they choose the ones that I like. Oh, I like those. Those are nice. And those. While it's testament to Deirdre's enduring popularity that something so mundane as a change of spectacles attracts such huge attention, nothing compares to the publicity surrounding Deirdre's wrongful imprisonment for fraud after falling for conman pilot John Lindsay in 1998. Have you anything to say? I didn't do any of it. Right, take the defendant down. Fact and fiction became blurred today over a court case. Overnight, Coronation Street fans began a campaign to free Deirdre Rashid, who was jailed in last night's episode. And now it seems even the Prime Minister wants to get involved. That was the first time I realised how big it had got. And I got a phone call from my mother-in-law saying, are you watching the news? And I said, no. She said, well, switch it on for the second half because you, you're, on the news at, you're on news at 10. And I said, don't be silly, Barbara. I can't be. She said, you are. You are, and the Prime Minister's getting involved. I said, what? Deirdre! We'll get you out. Don't worry, we'll do everything we can. The storyline prompted the biggest response the show has ever seen, and a national campaign was launched to free the Weatherfield One. The two type of cons in here. Do you know what they are? Them that make it, <gasps> and them that don't. But as the entire nation watched Deirdre hit the depths of despair, no one knew that privately Anne Kirkbride was also falling apart. She didn't know it, but Annie was starting to suffer from clinical depression. Oh, yeah. Life became unbearable, absolutely intolerable. I wanted to die. I just wanted to die because you just don't want to go on living, feeling like that. But you're frightened that if you die, you might still feel like that on the other side. It's just, there's no escape. OK, Deirdre, come on. What are you doing? The doctor's going to give you something to calm you down. No! Oh, all right, Deirdre, no, stay no, calm. No, no, Deirdre, no, no, Deirdre, this will make you right. feel better. Now, no. stay calm. Ah. That's it. That's all right, Deirdre. Ah. Yeah. OK, you're fine no. now. Barely able to function, she continued to film the most harrowing scenes of her career. <laughs> she didn't burden other people with it. She could have done, she could have made everybody miserable with it, but she didn't. You know, she might have a cry and say, I can't do this in the dressing room, but you take her out on that studio floor, marvellous, absolutely marvellous. No, she didn't burden anybody with it. It was worse than the cancer in a way because I knew that was going to be over and I knew it was bad, you know, but I knew that at the end of it I was going to be better. But this was just so frightening. I just didn't know if I was ever going to be better. I just couldn't see a way out of it. I just couldn't believe that there could be a cure for what was broken in my head. Annie found counselling an enormous help, but it wasn't enough to combat her feelings. She was also prescribed daily antidepressants, which she still takes. It's just a question of taking one tablet every morning. Um, there are no long-term side effects. Um, and it's just made such a huge difference to my life. Oh, Deirdre, you have got big oh, eyes. Oh, Deirdre. <laughs> <laughs> Your eyes massive. They do, not <laughs> Double the size. Yes, I've seen double. 
<laughs> it was like I suddenly became the me I'd always wanted to be. The me that I'd never quite been able to get to. Out of fear, whatever, I don't know. But it was like I got to the real me, finally, and was able to bring it out and share it with people properly. And to live. I feel like I'm living for the first time in my life. Really living. Instead of just standing, watching other people do it and trying to copy what they did. Whatever quality she has, and it is a very fine quality, it's brought her through and she's still as wonderful and zany as ever. A life enhancer. <laughs> <laughs> I stand like that. <laughs> and we stand up behind you. <laughs> I'm very happy these days. I've got a good marriage and I've got my health. And what more could I want? A good job. Yeah. I'm quite happy with my lot. And that will do it for me. Bye bye. No! No, you're in tomorrow. Yeah, see, I'm doing Susie tomorrow. Yeah, next week. I'm in four days in the studio, isn't it? Is it? I don't know. Are you in the studio? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on Thursday again. Will we? Yeah, send me a little message. I will. I will. If it all ended tomorrow, I'd, I'd, I'm sure she would cope. I don't know how she would, but uh, she would. She'd, she'd find something else. What do you think she'd do? Well, I said she could always become a cleaner, cleaning Granada Studios, you know. It's, she's good at it. <laughs> That's it now for today. Sainsbury's here, I come. Thank you. Very much. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. We got clear. Thanks, Billy. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Ta -ta. Thanks for coming. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Bye, love. See you tomorrow. Thanks.